morning, everyone. Everyone's awake today. That's a good thing. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and I'm excited to be continuing in our Corinthians series, Those Crazy Corinthians. This is where we are looking at the books of the Bible called First and Second Corinthians. If you're new here among us, these are in the New Testament portion of our Bibles, between Romans and Galatians. They're letters, actually, written by Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth. They're experiencing some issues there. They're asking questions, those crazy Corinthians. So we are asking the question, are we any different today in the church, the modern church? That is the overlying question throughout this whole series. The theme this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, will be the Christian example. There are going to be two underlying themes underneath that umbrella theme for two different groups of people, perhaps. For beginners, if you don't know anything about the Bible, if you're new here, you're going to get a look at what good godly leadership looks like from a biblical perspective. Accepting discipline, perhaps, from God or leadership. If you've been around for a while, you're going to get challenged, hopefully, this morning. If you are awake, you've had your coffee, and you're listening. A call to maturity, to grow up in the faith. But the umbrella theme here is the Christian example. That is what binds it all together and what we are going to look at this morning. Before we begin, I want to say a prayer for those going out to Penny Farms this afternoon. If you don't know what that is, it is a mid-range type of mission trip, just about, what, five hours away, Jacksonville area. What they'll be doing is they're going up to Penny Farms where they make personal energy transportation vehicles. I hope that I got that right. P-E-T. My wife and I went with the crew last year. And so what you do is you help assemble these vehicles that can be operated by hand. You don't need legs to power them. Uh, In third world countries, they have landmines around left over from wars and people often lose their legs. So we've heard stories about uh, people having to crawl from a village to, let's say, the marketplace with their children on their backs at times. It's horrible. So these vehicles help those people. And so they'll be up there for how many days? Four four days? Four? Uh, Four days in the Jacksonville area. So when it comes around next year, if you're curious about missions or getting a little bit out of your comfort zone, that would be a good thing to sign up for. So let me pray for them this morning and that trip. Lord, we ask for your blessings over those going to be a blessing We ask that you deliver them there safely and bring them back home safely. Lord, I thank you for their heart, for service, for their willingness to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this mission. Lord, I ask that you bless all those who receive these PET vehicles, these transportation vehicles. Bless them. Ultimately, let them come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. Be with everyone involved in this project. Again, bless it abundantly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a quick note this morning before we begin about biblical preaching. What biblical preaching looks like kind of behind the scenes. Biblical preaching begins with prayer and is bathed in prayer throughout, regardless of what the text is that I have to preach from and unpack, it begins with prayer. If you're paying attention, you know that that kind of throws me off sometimes. You see, when I wrote the guidebook for this series, I thought, cool, this is going to be an easy season. I've just pre-written all of my sermons. God said, not so much. And so a couple weeks ago, we saw we ended up in Job. I was like, how did we end up there? And then I had to connect the dots for all of you. I was very uncomfortable with that. But after that message, several people came up to me and said, that is exactly what I needed to hear. So in obedience, we see blessings. We see fruit when we are obedient, even if it makes us uncomfortable. 
So once I get my message done, <laughs> I put it in a Dropbox folder. Church and other leaders here at the church have access to it. They can read the message if they want. This creates really good accountability. And even after that, I check with pastor friends, even my wife Heather, so that the message can be understood by a wide range of people, not just theologians. Everybody is going to get something out of it, hopefully. Some have noted, I use a lot of scriptures. This is really, aside from prayer, the key to biblical preaching. Scriptures. We see this when we read the New Testament. They are constantly doing this. Whether you know it or not, whether your Bible outlines it or not, a good Bible will. They'll put it in bold. As they're writing the New Testament, they're constantly quoting Scriptures to reinforce their point. The preaching is like that. Whether it's Paul, Stephen, or Peter, they're constantly using Scriptures or paraphrasing it. A couple of few weeks ago, I told you guys that the New Testament was one-third Old Testament. Whether you know it or not, you can't be a New Testament Christian. <laughs> when you read the New Testament, you're reading the Old Testament, whether you know it or not. So scriptures are very important to reinforce the point. I'll make a point, reinforce it with scripture. Make a point, reinforce it with scripture. So you really want to hear that from your preaching. You don't want just one scripture and then, hey, let me just talk about my cats or something like that for 30 minutes. No good. No bueno. We don't like that. <laughs> so this is one of the things we're going to see today in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> and, and here's the effect that it has in the New Testament and why the Corinthians can receive Paul's, as we'll see, hard teaching. When you use a lot of scriptures, people who are familiar with their Bibles will recognize it as true. It'll sound familiar to you. Even if you don't know your Bible well, if you've got a heart for God, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll recognize it as true because the Bible is God's Word. You'll be comfortable with it. It puts you in the right place. I gave that analogy about music a few weeks ago, right? Like, even if you've never heard a song before, if you've listened to a lot of music, you'll be able to tell if they hit a bad or a good note, right? It'll ring true or not to you. So it's a similar type of thing. And what this does is it gives preachers who are doing it properly, or Paul in this case, the ability to say some really challenging or difficult things because it's really hard to argue with the truth. It comes from a place of truth. And as we'll see today, Paul is saying these things as a father figure to them. So they know it's coming from a place of love. Really, really important. So let's do a quick, quick, quick overview of what we've seen so far. A lot of people don't realize when you're reading these letters or these books of the Bible is that it's not like one chapter and then the next chapter we move on to the next subject, the next chapter, no. The chapter and verse numbers were not in the original letters. They didn't come around till around the New Testament a thousand years later for reference purposes. So you have to imagine it as one continuous stream. So the theme is actually first through fourth, or chapters one through four, first Corinthians. The theme is disunity or the call for unity. This disunity is caused by the Corinthians following after human things, human wisdom, human teachers, human speakers. So I gave this illustration at the Bible study. It's kind of like a finger pointing to the moon. It's an old Chinese proverb, if you saw Enter the Dragon, you probably would have heard this one by Bruce Lee. It's like a finger pointing to the moon. If you focus on the finger, you miss the moon and all its heavenly glory. So this is what the Corinthians are doing. Paul, Apollos, Peter, who cares? They're just fingers pointing to Jesus. If you focus on them, you miss Jesus. It's okay to notice some things. But it's like the worship team, right? If I'm sitting here the whole time saying, wow, man, Alex is such a good singer. He's such a good singer. He's such a good singer. That's not the point. The point was to worship Jesus. He's pointing to Jesus. So you can't be fixated on the singer. They're just instruments. Right? So that's what's going on here in Corinth. And so you see that because he's coming as a father figure, he's got a good point, he's able to call them babies. He calls them babies in chapter 3. Babies are not ready for solid food. This is the equivalent 
of someone being a Christian for many, many years and still demanding very simple messages that feel good from flashy preachers. Preachers got to be on point. That person should be ready for complicated teachings from any sort of preacher. It should not matter as long as it's biblically grounded. Jesus is what this is all about. So just like the Corinthians, we have Christians in the church today who claim to be really mature, but they demand simple, feel-good messages. Don't step on my toes. Don't want to do that. But like the Corinthians, they do church, then they go home. Gossip, talk trash about the leadership, cause disunity. This is what's going on there. Do we have that in the church today? Mm. They call other people babies. You're babies. But ironically, they ask for milk for themselves. So last week, Pastor Wayne talked about this, the idea of not being ready for solid food, needing milk. And he connected it to Hebrews. It comes up there as well. Hebrews 5. So let's do some quick review. We're going to reach back into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> just for the people who were not here last week or to refresh your memories. Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 1. Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still fleshly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, another, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? It is in the context of this behavior that Paul calls them babies. Imagine a pastor doing that today. Would that be warranted? Based on what we see in the Bible, and sometimes what we see in church, probably, yes. So in Hebrews, which Pastor Wayne cited, it is in the context of moving beyond the basic teaching. The author or authors are speaking about Melchizedek. That is a complicated teaching. They want to get into it with them, but this is what they say, Hebrews 5.11. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain, since you have been become too lazy to understand. Although by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the basic principle of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Now, if we continue in Hebrews, we see the author or authors go on to say this. Hebrews 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary or basic message about the Messiah, Jesus, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God. He just lists a bunch of the basic teaching. So, the idea here, the expectation, is that once we've been here for a while, we know the basics. Sure, we can be reminded of it, that's a great thing. But we're called to grow up. We're called to mature in what we know and in our actions. It's important. Not staying in elementary school for the rest of our lives like this guy. <laughs> I just softened it a little. I was going hard there for a minute. <laughs> but as many still do today, the Corinthians are boasting in their infancy. By contrast, the apostles are becoming fools for Christ. They are like the dirt on people's sandals, as Paul says. They're not acting puffed up or claiming to be great, even though they're apostles. They could be. So we'll see in chapter 4 that Paul needs to correct some of this behavior and does so a little harshly. So he will remind them about his relationship with them, where the correction is coming from. 1 Corinthians 4, starting at verse 14. He writes, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children, for you can have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you can't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. That'll be important later. 
This is why I've sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful son in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in the church. Now, some of you are inflated with pride, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will know not the talk, but the power of those who are inflated with pride. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you want? Should I come to you with a rod? Or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Tough love there. I'm going to put you over my knee. (laughs) When you really love someone, you can say some really difficult things to them, right? When they know that you love them, they know the place it's coming from, right? A place of love. I'm not saying it's okay for you guys to argue with each other all the time. So let me paint a picture for you here. Imagine that I get wind, so I hear everything. (laughs) My wife laughed. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Imagine I get wind of some of you complaining about me, saying, you know, he's always asking me to read my Bible, but I don't want to read my Bible. It takes too much time. He uses all these scriptures and flipping all over the place. I don't want to do that. That's what we pay him for. He's the pastor. He's supposed to read the Bible and explain it to me on a Sunday while I drink my coffee. Do that? Okay. So Tuesday morning rolls around. Why Tuesday morning? That's when we have our staff meeting. Staff notices, I've added something to the minutes, to the office. I would like you to buy 200 Baby bottles. Now, someone is going to make the mistake of asking why. Is it for PRC, Pregnancy Resource Center? What are we buying these bottles for? Baby bottles. Why do you need baby bottles? I'm glad you asked, Carol Lee. <laughs> well, you see, people are complaining about me. They don't want to read their Bibles. I guess they're babies. Babies can't read. You know what else babies can't do? Babies can't drink coffee. So we're going to take all the coffee away and replace it with milk in these bottles. And then they can suck on that during my sermon on Sunday morning. If you thought I said a bad word, that's on you. (laughs) I sometimes say some really hard things, right? Now, those of you who don't know me, they're probably like, that pastor's a jerk. I don't know if that's a bad word or not, but whatever, we're just going to roll with it. (laughs) But those of you who know me, you laughed. A lot of people laugh because you know me, right? You never do that. (laughs) There's like nervous laughing, right? Yeah. You know who would think it was awesome, even if they didn't know me? A pastor, a visiting pastor. Yes! I've always wanted to do that. You guys laugh because you know. You know my heart, right? You know I just want you to learn. (laughs) I want you to get into the Bible. So you get the lesson. You go, okay, give me my coffee back though. But I get it. You know why I'm saying it. So this is what we see in the verses from this week and last week. Paul is a father to them. He has a relationship with them. It all begins with relationship. You have to know the place from which a person is coming from. Paul says, I'm a father to you in Christ Jesus. So you can get away with some hard stuff here. So in that light, we need to look at what the Bible says about a father's discipline. Proverbs 3.11, don't get scared. Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father, the son he delights in. Why discipline? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Hebrew Hebrews, let's do 12, starting at verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you are reproved by him. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, 
which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had natural fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit, so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the fruit of peace and righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline yields the fruit of peace and righteousness by those who are trained by it. We are trained by it. It's for our benefit. It helps us to grow up. The other side. But a good father leads by example. A good father is disciplined himself. Proverbs 23, 26, sorry about that. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Good leadership is not asking people to do what you will not do yourself. Like climbing up really high on ladders. There's a pastoral exemption for that. That was a staff joke. <laughs> so, so many things so high up in here. Why? <laughs> Jesus' death on the cross means that God doesn't ask us to do anything. He wouldn't do himself. This is the basis by which God can give some really tough love and discipline and how we should easily accept it. And by extension, the way Paul gives tough love. Paul is a really serious leader. He is a general on the front lines. If you were with us from our Philippians series, it was be like Jesus. That was the overlying theme. Philippians 3, verse 10, my goal Paul writes, is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Paul invites them and us, the church by extension, <clears throat> to follow his example. He's being like Jesus and calls them to be like Jesus. Philippians 1, verse 29, For it has been given to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And both his sufferings, which are numerous, which we will see later on in this series, he'll go on to talk about them, but also in his good behavior, how Paul deals with it. He invites them to imitate him as he imitates Christ. We saw this both in our Philippian series and in this one. Philippians 3.17, join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Corinthians in this chapter, therefore I urge you to imitate me. So we see an example of the chain effect that this has in the church. To Jesus, then to the leadership, then throughout the church. A good example of this is in 1 Thessalonians, also written by Paul, co-authored by Silvanus and Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 1, starting at verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. See that theme there? In the Holy Spirit, with much assurance. You know what kind of men we were among you for your benefit. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, in spite of your severe persecution. You welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. A good example starts with the leadership and works its way throughout the church. If I'm telling you to read your Bible, I need to be reading mine. I'm telling you to be healthy, that that's a good godly attribute. I need to be eating healthy. I need to be leading well in that. I'm telling you not to use profanity. I need to not say bad words all the time. This is the basis for all good leadership. We must lead by example. Philippians 4, verse 9. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen 
in me, and the God of peace will be with you. But it extends beyond the church into our personal lives as Christians, especially those of us who are parents. If we are parents, we are leaders, like it or not. We need to be an example in everything, from what comes out of our mouths to what we put in our mouths. If we want our kids to be healthy, right, we need to eat healthy ourselves. We have to have healthy choices in the house. We have to lead by example. We can't eat fast food every single meal, right? The data is out on that. It is not good for you. This is comparable to teaching a good, spiritually nutritious message on a Sunday morning. Cheap, greasy, fast food preaching is poison to the soul. Good teaching, like solid food or meat that Pastor Wayne talked about last week, can be hard to swallow, hard to chew on. Fast food, like cheap, greasy grace preaching, is easy to swallow, but it isn't good for you. It's easier to sell. It's convenient, but that doesn't mean you should buy it. Now, I could teach you stuff that makes you feel good all the time, just great about yourself, no matter what you're doing. Shallow teaching with very little substance or nutrition. It would be easy to swallow and digest. It would always make you feel good temporarily. But then you just have to come back each week and get your spiritual batteries charged. Is that the point? Or should we be growing up? Spiritual Chinese food. It's always going to leave you hungry. Spinning your wheels. But you would not be getting spiritually well. You wouldn't be growing up in the faith. Worse yet, this is what happens. Your faith would be shallow and therefore very easily shaken. As a pastor and spiritual father to you, it is my job to train you for a very serious spiritual fight. The devil's not playing games. If I'm your teacher, and this is your church, I can promise you that if you listen to me, you'll learn more about the Bible. You'll grow up spiritually. You'll not end up like many whom I've seen who play church for decades even. They don't grow up. They go home, and they're almost completely unrecognizable as Christians. They're wearing a spiritual black belt, but they don't know how to fight. These are the people that have a gym membership, but they don't want to put the work in. So they don't lose weight, nor do they gain any muscle. They waste their time on the treadmill, and behind closed doors, they ruin it. My desire for you as your pastor and teacher is that you experience real, qualitative, spiritual growth. You're called to get off the bottle as soon as we are able and develop the mind of Christ so that we can be stars in the world to those around us. Shiny ones, not rock stars. We can be beacons of hope and love to a dying world. We can lead people from this world to the next. That's the point. This is how the good news about Jesus spreads. By example. Yes, with words, certainly. But with actions that match them and attract people to the faith. Like Paul, we need to be an example because people are watching us. As a parent, especially, people are watching you. The kids are always watching. Now, I get it. Maybe you didn't have a good example. Maybe some of us have resentments against our parents. Maybe we're angry with them. Maybe they weren't a good example. But that should make us think. We ought not make that mistake ourselves. So we need to get over it. We need to move on. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus 
You need to let go of it and let God. Again, we might not have had a good earthly example, but we need to fix our eyes on the Father that we are going to be spending a whole lot more time with. Unlike our earthly parents, God set the ultimate example for us. He paid the ultimate price for us. That is why the gospel must be preached. All of our thinking about God needs to be done in the shadow of the cross. The cross invites us to think rightly about God, how much he loves us and never asks us to do anything he wouldn't do himself. What you must know is that God loves you. You must know and hear that this morning. We may not understand why it is that we're going through what we're going through, what we're experiencing, but we know that it is for our good. 1 John 3, starting at verse 1. Look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. We know that this world is not perfect. So, whatever we're going through, whether it's pain or prosperity, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because we are just renting space here temporarily. Our citizenship, our true home, is in heaven. So I want to leave you this morning with a glimpse of the future into a glimpse into the future in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 16. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. For what is seen, unseen, is eternal. My prayer for you all this week is that the God of peace would comfort you in whatever you're going through. And that you would feel the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then share that love with others around you. Amen? I love you guys.